Hello, and welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Laura. I'm Kate. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. Every episode, we sit down to chat about the two books read most recently by our book clubs. What did we make of them? Did they spark debate? And whether we loved them or hated them, the big question is, were they great book club books? Our two books this month are Hagseed, Margaret Atwood's retelling of The Tempest by William Shakespeare, and Border by Katka Kasabova, a travel memoir stroke cultural history about the border that separates Bulgaria, Turkey and Greece. We'll also hear from reluctant reader Michael Walderman on how his book club helped him find a place for books in his busy life. I read slowly and I am intellectually lazy and read a lot of newspapers and magazines. But when invited to become part of a book club by two friends who said they needed interesting people, which was flattering, but also men, which was self-evident <laughs> that I, I fulfilled that, I was intrigued and said yes. So stay tuned. All that and more coming up on the Book Club Review. It's been a little while since our last episode because you, Laura, have been away. How was your trip? I had a really great trip. I was back on the West Coast in Seattle, Portland and Vancouver visiting family. I had a really good time. I visited lots of beautiful bookshops. They've got amazing independent bookstores in Seattle and Portland in particular. And actually, if anyone wants to see nice snaps of those shops, they should visit our Instagram feed at The Book Club Review. I cannot tell you how impatient I've been to discuss both books that we're talking about today. So let's start with Hagseed. Did you manage to read it? Yes, of course. Did I manage to read it? Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Yeah. I would assume, but you know, because you were traveling. I picked up a very nice edition, actually, in Powell's Books in Portland. Uh, it's got a beautiful red cover, which is slightly different to the British edition. Yes, and it actually has barbed wire on the front with a little tiny boat, which is actually far more appropriate, I think, than the... Quite dramatic, but also slightly irrelevant cover that the UK edition has, um, which is this very beautiful, very dramatic woodcut, but doesn't really relate that much to the story. But let's talk about the story. <laughs> yes, back to the story. Book cover designer. So after our last book, Secondhand Time by Svetlana Alexievich, which was a 700 page nonfiction account of life in Soviet Russia, we were kind of in the mood for something undemanding. And Rob and Sally in my book club had both read this and enjoyed it, and so they suggested that we discuss it. Hagseed is part of the Hogarth Shakespeare Project, which I think is uh, an imprint of Penguin Books. And they've asked various well-known best-selling authors to reinterpret Shakespeare's plays. So we have Jeanette Winterson, who kicked off the series with The Gap of Time, which is based on The Winter's Tale. And Tyler did Taming of the Shrew. Howard Jacobson has done The Merchant of Venice, and so on. And here we have Margaret Atwood's take on The Tempest. The central character is Felix, who is a successful avant-garde theatre director, who, when we meet him, is preparing for a production of The Tempest. He's also mourning his daughter, Miranda, who died from meningitis when she was only three. And he's buried in his grief, and he doesn't notice that his one-time assistant, Tony, has designs on his job, and in fact succeeds in getting Felix fired. So he packs up and he leaves and he finds a secluded cabin in the wilderness. He persuades the owners to let him live there and he uses a fake name, Mr. Duke. And he seems to be alone, but in fact he has company in the imagined form of his daughter, Miranda, who has grown up in his mind as she wasn't able to in real life. I'd like to read you a little bit here. At this point in the story, Miranda would have been eight years old. During the day, she was often outside, playing in the field behind the house or in the woodlot at the back. He would see a cloud of butterflies lift in the meadow. She must have startled them. When blue jays or crows would make a fuss in the woods, he'd conclude that Miranda had been walking there. Squirrels chattered at her. Grouse whirred away at her approach. In the dusk, fireflies marked her path, and owls greeted her with muffled calls. It's a beautiful passage, and it's one... It reflects well this um, slight tenuous grasp on reality that Felix has at this point in the story and, and indeed you know, throughout the entire as of events unfold is that Miranda is with him and he acknowledges that she's imaginary even as he speaks to her all the time. Yeah, I thought the idea of the um, imagined daughter the ghost daughter was incredibly well done and it felt incredibly true. I have an idea that people who have lost someone close to them do continue to count the days to mark the passage of time and to imagine 
how old that person might have been as time passes. And Atwood weaves this in really brilliantly. What happens next is that Felix decides after 12 years, effectively brooding in his cabin, he decides he is ready to go back out into the world again. And he gets a job at the local penitentiary and he starts to teach the inmates drama. He decides that they are going to do a series of productions of plays in the prison. And so Atwood manages to get in her idea of the play within the play. That's one of the... Within the play. Within the play. (laughs) It's one of the ideas in the original Tempest. And there's this cast of characters who are all prison inmates from the stockbroker who's sort of fiddling the books right down to the kind of carjacker. There's this, a range of seriousness of crimes that they've they've all committed. and The whiz kid hacker as well. The hacker, that's right. What's his name? His name is Eight Hands, I Eight. believe. <laughs> it's spelled H-A-N-D-Z. H- yes, because they're, they all are given nicknames. That, that was one of my favourite things, actually, in this book, is that when Felix goes into the penitentiary and sets up the play for that year, he insists that everyone take a handle or a nickname for themselves. And so Eight Hands is the one that was chosen by the hacker, for example. He also bans swearing. But people are allowed to swear using the curse words from the play itself. And so at the very beginning, when they all get together, they make this long list of all the curse words and then memorize them so that they can deploy them with force throughout rehearsals. It's quite hard for me to talk about this book without really talking about what I thought about it, because it was an interesting book club, because my book club and I were very much at odds. The prevailing feeling in the book club was that this was fine and that people had enjoyed it and... I don't think anyone really thought too much of it. And I had just huge problems with so many parts of it. One of the things that really bothered me was the dialogue. I just found the dialogue absolutely excruciating. I felt like this issue to do with language and swearing. So there's this conceit that they're only allowed to use swear words that are in the play, which seemed very artificial to me. But at the same time, I quite liked the idea of it. I thought, oh, you know, that's quite nice. But what bothered me was the language the rest of the time. She kind of tiptoes around using words that I feel people would actually speak. I didn't notice this at all. No, so so there's one point where when his assistant is in the process of telling him that he's effectively got him fired and he says something like, cripes, Tony, why would you do that? And I was like, cripes? Who says cripes? Canadians, I, Kate. Do Canadi- Canadians say cripes. I'm so glad you're here. This is- <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I, am, I am Canadian, but I have no idea if Canadians still say cripes. But then I thought, well, who is she writing this for? Is, is she writing it for children? Is she writing it for people who somehow can't handle what would probably be said in that situation, which I don't think would be cripes. I think it would be, <laughs> it would be a four-letter word. Um, <laughs> Why is she dancing around this? I found that the unreality of the dialogue really seriously interfered with my ability to empathise with any of these characters. The other key character is the actress who comes into the prison to play Miranda, the Miranda in the play. And she's a dancer and she's a choreographer and she's working with the prisoners so that they can choreograph these songs that they write. And she also, her the language that, that she uses, I just... I couldn't hear her voice. I had no sense of what she was like as a person. And it's funny you say that because for me, she's one of the most realised characters in the book. Well, this came up in the book club, which I nearly blew a gasket because I was like, you know, do you know why she's real? At the end of the book, there's a little note from Atwood about her research and her thinking behind the book, which I read with great interest, actually. That was one of the most interesting parts of the book was me, was how she came to it. And uh, it turns out that the character of the woman who plays Miranda, what's her name? Can you remember? Anne-Marie Greenland. Anne-Marie Greenland is a real person. She's a person who won an auction for charity in order to be in the book. So uh, to my mind, that was why I would have made her a bit more realistic than the others, because she actually (laughs) was based on a real person. (laughs) Well, you used the phrase cast of characters before, and there literally is a cast of characters in this book. When they introduce the cast for The Tempest, they run through the prisoners one by one. And again, the conceit is that Felix has drafted this cast of characters for Anne-Marie because she's going to be coming into the prison and she needs to have a sense of who she's dealing with and what their crimes were so that she feels comfortable. But that just means that the characters who we then, um, I'd say we get to know, we don't get to know them, the characters that then populate the rest of the plot are kind of sound bites. Eight Hands was a hacker. This is his ethnic background. This is what he did. Probably not a threat. The cast of characters gives that level of detail for everyone else. 
I so agree. Why weren't you there on the night to back me up? Because I, was just like, I couldn't believe that no, no one else seemed to mind about this, but people didn't. And, and no one developed in any way. No one really changed. It's a novel entirely driven by plot, which can be all right if it's a gripping plot. But the plot here is its interest derives from how it adapts The Tempest. And I have read The Tempest, although I must admit the the characters and the plot of The Tempest only really came back to me towards the very end when I was like, oh, right, okay, that's happening because that happens in the original and that's happening. Oh, and that character represents that character in the play. How many people had read The Tempest or seen it performed? I think it's probably one of the Shakespeare plays people tend to be slightly more familiar with and I think that was the feeling with book club I think either people had studied it at school or they had seen it on stage and it's one of those ones that does stay with you because it's got this sort of dramatic fantasy set up this hugely charismatic central character but again this was another issue I had with it I know that play I think that's a play particularly that I think about the language and the poetry of it you know those were pearls that were his eyes well and that poetry perhaps comes through when Margaret Atwood riffs on the play's original language on behalf of her inmate prisoners I thought that was quite brilliant I I liked the bits where eight hands or the other inmates had rewritten it in their own jargon well this is interesting i i hated that too i didn't really like that i found it really uh, well it's kind of humorous because margaret atwood is a 60 or 70 something canadian woman it felt i felt sort of slightly embarrassed rapping rapping as if she's a 20 something uh, inmate yeah with the rapping scenes and i robert argued that whenever you see rap lyrics written down it always reads badly because that's not of course that's not how it's supposed to be performed and we had a little discussion about hamilton the play which is the life of, I'm sure everyone knows, but the life of Alexander Hamilton, the founding father in America, told in rap form with music. And I had suggested that I thought perhaps Atwood had seen it and then gone away and thought, yeah, you know, I'm going (laughs) to, I'll do Shakespeare in rap, (laughs) which I felt wasn't particularly original. And I just thought it was really done badly. But other people didn't have such a problem with it. And actually, I think your comment just then about the language and the immediacy of the language and how Shakespeare himself used language. He wanted his plays to appeal to everybody, the highest and the lowest. He wanted to get everybody involved. And so I kind of was talked around to the idea that actually of appreciating that device perhaps more than I had when I read it on the page. One of the reasons I love Margaret Atwood is because she's so fearless. At the same time, I've never loved any book by Margaret Atwood, I must confess. Ever. Even The Handmaid's Tale, I think, is wildly overrated. Well, so I then was casting about, I've I've only ever read The Handmaid's Tale. And when I was making my argument about the characters and how I felt that the characters in this were so utterly one-dimensional, I was casting my mind back to The Handmaid's Tale. And I was thinking, well, what were the characters in that? I thought the the main character in that, I remember she's sort of, yeah, this, this trapped woman in this sort of slave system where she's forced to produce children or she's going to be cast out into some hinterland. But the idea of her as a person and her hopes and dreams and I don't really remember anything about that and so I thought well maybe Margaret Atwood just doesn't really do character in that way but then Robert again turned around and and it was true he was defending it 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 was his book choice um I think he you know he he rightly wanted to stand up for her but he turned around and he said no no he said I've read other Atwoods and and she's fantastic at character it's it's not you know it's not that she can't do character oh I don't know I've read a lot of books by her. What have I read? I've read The Blind Assassin. I read Alias Grace, which I did enjoy, but maybe because it's historical fiction more than anything. And I read Cat's Eye when I was in grade 11 or 12. And all I remember about that is this haunting depiction of this depressed teenage girl tearing off the skin on the bottom of her feet. It was a form of self-harm. And that image has stuck with me, even though nothing else in that book has. (laughs) Mm. <laughs> Lovely. No, but this, Margaret Atwood, there's something always a little bit cold about her writing. I think the root of my problem with this book was the passage that I just read was full of such lyricism and beauty. And that came through so wonderfully in the evocation of the relationship between Felix and this imaginary person in his life, this daughter. And it was so sensitively done. And I thought it drew so wonderfully on my idea of the poetry and the language that Shakespeare used that sort of infuses that play, The Tempest. And so uh, there was that artistry there, which I was enjoying and appreciating, and I was therefore so annoyed that it was just thrown away 
for every other aspect of the story. It's like she just felt like she didn't really have to bother. And Andy said, Andy in my book club, he enjoyed the book, but he did say he felt like she just kind of knocked it out. And she's capable of that, to be honest. I think she can. She knocks out most of her books. I mean, I had the the pleasure of looking through her manuscripts for The Handmaid's Tale when I was studying at the University of Toronto. And her first draft was basically fully formed. I mean, I'm sure not in her mind, but it was not uh, a do-over. She she had written it all out, marked it up a little bit, and then sent it to someone to type up. So she's a whiz of a writer. She's the ultimate professional. She really can churn it out. And uh, I, I read a review about Anne Tyler's Vinegar Girl, which is the book based on Taming of the Shrew. And the headline was Skilled but Pointless, which made me laugh because that's kind of how I feel about this book. Yeah, I it was an interesting exercise. I also I couldn't deny that the structure, the way that she had structured it and the way that she draws it together at the end is very clever. And so I couldn't write it off as being unworthy of anyone's time. It's not. But at the same time, it did feel like an exercise to me. But then other people enjoyed it more than me. And maybe I'm just not factoring the potential enjoyment of it. Was it a good book club book then? Well, even that, you see, I think if I hadn't hated it so much, I don't think it would have been a good discussion because I think everyone just would have sort of sat around and said, yeah, you know, she kind of did this quite well and this was good. And You were wondering who this book was for, what age range. And actually, I think it'd be a great book for a high school class to read alongside The Tempest. Because honestly, I wish Margaret Atwood had taught me The Tempest. Uh, <laughs> she does tease out some really interesting insights into the characters and the language and the motivation, but it feels quite educational. Maybe that's the thing. So yeah, all in all, I don't know. My book club quite liked it. I really didn't. So it's I, quite an easy read. It it doesn't. Yeah, it doesn't take up much of your time. That said, I didn't find it gripping. <laughs> We're very lukewarm readers. That's what. Yeah, that's what we are. We're equivocal. Laura and I love our own book clubs, but we also love hearing about other people's. Today, our interview starts with a shocking confession. My name's Michael Waldman, and I make documentary programs for television. And I'm not much of a reader of books. I read slowly and I am intellectually lazy and read a lot of newspapers and magazines. But when invited to become part of a book club by two friends who said they needed interesting people, which was flattering, but also men, which was self-evident <laughs> that I, I fulfilled that, I was intrigued and said yes. And so it's not your book club. Tell me about how it works. Who runs it? It was started by three or four people, and one person sends the basic email saying it is at this person's house and at this time, and this is the book we've chosen. We meet in various members' houses, and yes, what happens is the person who's suggested they'll host it, they provide a basic supper. It's not meant to be a grand dinner party, but people seem to be good cooks, which is great, and there's some wine, and we all arrive and chat about the book and then have the supper and often continue the chat about the books and other things afterwards. So it's very friendly and informal. And the group, I mean, I was invited by two people who are friends of mine, so obviously I knew some of them, but there are others who I hadn't met at all and only meet there. And they're not necessarily all people I would necessarily have as friends or spend much time with, but they are all delightful. And when I do turn up, I'm really pleased to see them and remember some of their opinions about previous books and so on. So there's a relationship that is to do with books as well as friendship. And when you discuss the books, how does that discussion work? Do you take turns or do you all just freely chip in as and when you, you've got something you want to say? in theory, and it sort of mostly works, is that the book having been chosen, those attending having read it, we are, we assemble at the person who's hosting its house. Wine is drunk and we start. And usually the per one person has always been chosen to introduce it, quite often the person who's proposed it at the previous meeting, not always. And that person does a sort of basic introduction. And then it's open to discussion. And in theory, we're sitting in sofas and chairs around in a sort of vague circle and it goes you know, from one side to the other. People chip in, of course, because it's not, it's not formal. Uh, at the end of the discussion, there is a discussion about what should be the next book. I was going to ask you how you choose your books. Often people come with suggestions. They, as it were, advocate for the reason why they think the next book should be X. Somebody else says, no, I think it should be Y. And uh, there's anything between three and four and uh, half a dozen suggestions. And then it comes to a vote. So it's a democracy. So we... Oh, a vote. That's interesting. Yes, because basically the woman who is sort of 
as it were, informal chair, tends to say, right, let's now vote. And sometimes it has to go to a sort of second round. I mean, if, you know, if it's, if it's complicated, if there's sort of two things that everybody wants and there's equals and then we vote on that, rather like the French election coming up, it's not quite as <laughs> passionate. And sometimes it's quite clear. But in a way, if there isn't a clear winner, if somebody is advocating X and the other person advocating Y and a third person advocating Z, how do we choose? Well, we vote. And tell me about the books. Do you archive at all? Do you have a sense of things that you've read in the past or do you just quite happily move on to the next one and... It's, a quite a, it's more about the process. I suppose there's an inbuilt instinct to variety in terms of what was done last time and what's going to be done next time. But it's mostly based on individuals' enthusiasms. I tend to read much less than I imagine people think I do in terms of actual solid books. I have my excuses that I read slowly and I'm busy and I'm sometimes abroad and I'm having to read newspapers and magazines to keep up with the world. One of the reasons I said yes was one, the pleasure of the company of the people who were inviting me. But also I thought it would be it would force me to read more than I do. And indeed, I would read things that were the suggestions of the month or whatever. And, and I'm very happy in a sort of passive way to to vote if I'm there as to what I think might be interesting, but to go with the flow and in some cases read things that I wouldn't have read otherwise. And is there something that you can think of that the book club really loved, that you loved, something you that led to a memorable evening? They're, all the evenings have been really interesting. I mean, if I look back and think about the books that we've discussed, they've all been, the, the discussions have been stimulating no matter what the book. I mean, there's definitely one book that I found completely wonderful and indeed, I remember the reading of it uh, as well as the discussion of it. It's a book called Beware of Pity by Stefan Zweig. He, he wrote a lot of short stories. He wrote one novel, Beware of Pity. And it's set in pre-war Europe. Uh, in fact, post-First World War. But it's very sort of middle European uh, in its feeling and, and Eastern Europe. And I was actually making a series about the Trans-Siberian Railway uh, with Joanna Lumley going on the journey, a three-part series for ITV. And I uh, therefore had very long train journeys, <laughs> to, which is a good thing to have a good book for. So curled up in our cabins as we're trundling through Siberia, uh, I was reading this book. And um, at sometimes I was completely uncommunicative with the camera team and indeed Joanna because I was sort of saying sorry can't talk I'm mean, obviously when we had to film we filmed but I was completely gripped by this book and of course did finish it because of the long train journeys and then arrived shortly back from uh, Moscow and and back to our book club and and was I remember the discussion of it was that I was extremely enthusiastic about it others were you know more or less so everybody liked it but it was a really interesting discussion which I felt the real benefit of the book club because I had had this experience of reading a book that I was gripped by. Uh, the very place and the circumstance of my reading were sort of relevant to the book in terms of area of the world or psychologies or polit politics, if you like, in a very broad sense. Um, and I wanted to share it, uh, you know, my views of the book. Uh, and to have the book club as a place to do that was wonderful. It sometimes can be a slightly dangerous if there's something that you really loved, you personally really responded to, you can feel a bit protective of it. And then, you know, exposing it to I have books that I wouldn't suggest for my book club because I'd be anxious in case they just it just got savaged and I just feel so distraught, even though I would be up for up for defending it. That's interesting. I haven't had that view. In other words, I went to that having read Beware of Pity by Stefan Schweig on my long Siberian train journeys, going to the book club to discuss it. I didn't worry too much about whether I'd be the only one who liked it or what other anybody else felt. I didn't feel the possessiveness that you describe or the or the attachment or, or the sort of um, the connection that uh, the defensiveness of it. I'd read a book which I'd enjoyed. I therefore wanted to talk about it. Book club was a perfect place to do that. I can see what you're saying that if to suggest a book to people that you love, you might be exposing, as it were, it or your affection for it to sort of uh, raised eyebrows of one form or another. I wouldn't worry about that myself. But as I say, I don't tend to suggest books. I'm very happy passively to receive the suggestions and vote on the ones that are, are given. Is there anything anything where it's it's maybe changed your opinion of a book through the discussion that you had? Oh, yes. There were times where I thought, when someone was very critical, I thought, yes, perhaps I'm being overindulgent of it, or the opposite. There hasn't been a book that I've 
read and gone to the book club about that I haven't been pleased that I read. I tend to find interest in things and people and, and see the point, even if it's not my choice. But it's lively when people do hate things. Obviously, that actually rouses discussion. And we have very open discussions. And it's interesting, the dynamics of any book club, I mean, any group of people, coming back to the sort of going around the circle. So there's a sort of variety of personalities, inevitably. It's a good little set of dynamics. <laughs> well, indeed, hence this, your podcast about it. The nature of a book club raises all sorts of interesting questions about A, books, and B, people. And have you found that it's changed your relationship with books, the way that you integrate books into your life? I read more as a result, and that's a good thing. For me, the peg of the book club, uh, you know, it's happening on Monday fortnight. This is the book that has been suggested. I still haven't read it. I must go and buy it or get on online and get it delivered you know, soon and put aside the weekend before to make sure I've done it. And that's good. It's a discipline. And it also is an eye opener. I mean, I'm reading as a result of other people's choices, things that I would never have come across. It's an entirely positive experience. Michael, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me about your book club. Well, I look forward to listening to this and others about book clubs. They are an interesting little phenomenon, aren't they? We think so. <laughs> so that was Michael. What did you think of him? Michael sounds amazing. I, I'm very envious of his trip on the Trans-Siberian Railway. Uh, nose deep in an amazing book, ignoring <laughs> Joanna Lumley and the rest of the, the crew. That sounds great. Yeah, wasn't that brilliant? Um, so he is from my mother-in-law's book club. i always so interested to hear about their book club and the discussions they have. Um, I often ask her what they're up to because um, it just sounds like a quite an intellectually fierce group of people who have had really fascinating careers and maybe they're still in the thick of them as Michael is or maybe they've now to step back and they're doing other interesting things and they read challenging books and I think they have very interesting and entertaining discussions about them. Do you think you could drop in? You could get yourself an invitation? I often say to her I'd love to be a fly on the wall. The thing I thought was interesting about that was their voting system. My mother-in-law actually clarified it for me so they'll each suggest a book and so they may have eight or ten titles to decide between and so they then each have two votes and so they'll go around the circle and they'll cast their votes and at the end of that process, you will have one or two or three, which are the which are the front runners, and then they may vote again. And that's okay. how they decide. Okay. It's quite a good way to do it, because sometimes you end up choosing a book almost out of fatigue. That actually happened the last time around. Um, we just I suggested to people that they come with some ideas, which we had never done before. Usually we do it off the top of our head. And the result was we had a ton of ideas and no one could decide on one. And so we kind of all hummed and hawed for quite a long time because by that point in the evening, you're a bit tired. And the result is uh, The Trouble with Goats and Sheep, which we're reading next time. And only time will tell whether it was a, a good result or not. Voting seems a great way to get around that, though. Yeah. The other thing I thought was interesting about him was the almost slightly not calculated. That's probably not quite the right word to use but the the conscious way in which he uses his book club to get over something that he perceives to be something that he'd like to redress in his life which is that he doesn't really find the time to read and so the book club for him is a something that makes him make that effort and which then clearly he finds hugely rewarding but I, I get the impression it's not something he's really able to do left to his own devices and he's quite conscious of that and and I like that. I thought, yeah, you know, it's almost like as a path to self-improvement. <laughs> book clubs are the way forward. Book clubs as discipline. Yeah. Well, my book club has a, has a certain amount of that because I read books I wouldn't read otherwise. Yeah, you know, which, which he said the same, absolutely. Yeah, if you're left to your own devices, you'll just read books that you want to read. But also that little sense of that slight pressure to actually complete something that you might not read left to your own devices. Something that's perhaps not an easy read or something that you're not enjoying 100% but you stick with it and you find you get something out of it anyway and that's what's rewarding. Because of the payoff which is that you get to engage in the discussion and talk to people who may have liked it who may have not disliked it um, but it's fun and the more you interact with those people and talk about books um, as, as Michael flags the more you look forward to hearing their perspectives which in itself keeps you going. And so, Laura, we turn to your latest book club book, Border, A Journey to the Edge of Europe by Kapka Kasabova. That name's a real tongue twister. I feel like every episode I say that, I've never heard of this author or this book, but I how I never had heard of this author. Um, when I looked her up, she's written quite a few things. So, yeah, how did you come to this book? 
Well, Border was only published, I think, in January of this year. And Charlie had read some reviews of it. Um, it was a BBC Radio 4 book of the week. So when he suggested it, everyone was quite keen. It's a travel memoir where Kapka Kasabova, who's Bulgarian by birth and lived in Sofia until about 17 before emigrating to New Zealand and eventually to Scotland, where she now lives. And she's drawn back to the border zone and this border that lies between Bulgaria, Turkey and Greece. And during the USSR, when Bulgaria was under the influence of USSR, although it was independent, this was another type of Iron Curtain. And often people would leave Germany, for example, and travel all the way down to try and cross over into Turkey or Greece and so escape Soviet influence. But that's just one thread in this memoir because Kapka is also very interested in the land and the mythology that exists in this area, which is one of the most forested and wild parts of Europe. And the history of the crossing of people, not just from north to south, but from south to north over the 20th century, in the present with refugees fleeing the Middle East. So although she's Bulgarian herself, she is an outsider and she's going to an area where sometimes she speaks the language, sometimes she doesn't. And we get her impressions of the land, but they are very subjective. And interestingly, at the beginning, she says that she is interested in the stories of the people who who live in this region and she does interview those people um but for me the descriptions of the land and the scenery were far more gripping i think than the stories which felt a little bit light especially having just read svetlana alexievich where her interviews are so um engrossing and the speaker becomes the whole story here it's very much Kasabova and subjects, people she is interviewing, and they are very other. She doesn't often get exactly what she's hoping from the interviews. I have to say, I perhaps also having got through secondhand time, I was procrastinating a little bit about reading this. I was just thinking, oh goodness, you know, is it going to be really hard going? And it's just not. It's just effortlessly beautiful and engaging to read. It draws you in and it the way she paints a picture of the places that she's travelling through, the language that she uses, I thought it was just wonderful. Read a bit. Let's hear some. After the summer of Strandia, it was a late flowering spring when I went to the twin border cities of central Thrace. The land was pale and exhausted with winter. Rivers thundered under and sometimes over bridges. Pink orchards blossomed and rubbish lay strewn on the sides of the west-east motorway, as if every traveller had chucked out a plastic bottle in revenge for some old insult. Lorries with international plates and mysterious cargoes shook the road. Three alphabets, three currencies, three versions of history. I had never been here before, and I'd heard that since the relative softening of the border, the Thracian plain had become a hub of entrepreneurs and consumers, desperados and smugglers. I love that, the land pale and exhausted with winter. And I just thought it was wonderful, this balance between this beautiful language and the story that she's telling and the people who come through it and the way that she captures all of that. Um, what did your book club make of it? One of the things we picked up on was that the language, while we really enjoyed it, there's something quite unusual about it. And some people actually thought that it had been translated into English. And it hasn't. She's, she's writing in English. But I wouldn't be surprised if some of her sentence constructions sort of mirror how you might speak in Bulgarian, because that is her native language. And I, I did really enjoy this book. I think it is very beautiful and the prose is very beautiful. But I kept stumbling over the language. Is that I, get, I would get really confused by the end of a sentence about what, where we had started um, because it was so uh, slightly, slightly strange. No, I, that's funny because I experienced the same. But for me, it kept me interested. And what about the characters that she encounters? She stays in different places on her journey. She goes to a little village on the border in Bulgaria in this region called Stranger. And she stays there for some time. And then there are other places that she visits. And then there are other places that she passes through. And she meets people along the way. And some of them are just little passing encounters. But with others, she forms relationships with them. And what did, you, what did your book club make of those? Well, we stumbled over over those characters and a little bit over the, the narrative itself, because I'm not sure if you've really clocked it, maybe in quite the same way that we did. Um, but in the preface at the beginning, she makes a caveat and she says, with a few exceptions, names have been changed and I have occasionally compounded topographic or biographic details in the interest of individual privacy and narrative economy. So for us, there's this big question mark over both the events as they unfold 
and the characters themselves because th- some of them, they're very memorable but Casabova seems to have some qualms about just depicting them as they were and so there's a bit of a filter there that seemed to get in the way and to me that makes me think that they were as they were to her because it's told from her point of view and it's it's subjective it's not objective in the way that for example Alexievich was where it was just interviews and people telling their stories themselves and that was just simply recorded this is very much Kasabova's take on the things that she encounters and her personality and character and the way she views the world comes through very very strongly and she and she's endearing certainly she's a bit of a dreamer but I, I, so I like very much one of the um, strongest encounters that happens in this book and it's something that is referred to um, before it it's sort of prefigured before it actually happens is a terrifying experience she has in the mountains with a man who has been guiding her for some time he's been traveling with her and showing her places and he takes her to this hilltop village that she has wanted to visit but she gets there and she realizes that the whole thing is basically just very dodgy she's in a place she doesn't know with a man she can't really trust she doesn't feel safe and she I think the realisation of that terrifies her and she runs away. But so the book opens with this scene and it's a long time before you come back to it actually happening. And what I really enjoyed about this book was the way that that event stood out strongest in her mind because of, because of that terror. But And the book kind of follows that and the people that she meets, some of them come through very strongly because obviously they are the ones that made the strongest impression on her. It's the only moment, I'd say, of high drama in the entire book. My book group had this conversation about how difficult it is, especially when you are an outsider, to to kind of stand up for yourself and just go, nope, I'm out of here. And how it's particularly difficult for women who are probably more vulnerable, definitely, in these situations. I had also been musing on the fact that she was female. I thought that was interesting. It's kind of a classic thing, isn't it? I've read plenty of male travel writers' books where they go off and, I don't know, I'm thinking of something like William Dalrymple from the Holy Mountain, where they go off and they travel and they meet people. And it's the same kind of thing. But what I liked very much about the fact that she did it was that I felt like she was able to have conversations with women that a male travel writer simply wouldn't have been able to have because they wouldn't have been accessible to him. At one point, she refers to a story untold. And what I liked about this was I felt like she had managed to tell more of the story than someone else who didn't have her background who possibly wasn't of her gender, would have been able to tell. Let's talk about refugees. I thought she did quite well at exploring what's going on currently with refugees coming over the border and also allowing us to empathise with the people that she meets who are in that situation. I think she identifies as a refugee herself, and she does at one point, um, uh, quite, quite obviously, and yet we struggled with this because um, in book club we talked about the fact like what is a refugee but there's also just a question about who are the people who decide to leave and who are the people who decide to stay and there's stories about some Bulgarian um, migrants or refugees depending on how you want to classify them who left and went to America and now are among the wealthiest Bulgarian Americans in, in the States and, uh, and they come back to visit. And then there's the people who've stayed. And she really mourns the depopulation of these villages along the border. Even as she hates the development that's also occurring, which would bring people back to this area of wilderness. Mm. Now, there's a real thing about Stranger, the village that she goes to at the beginning, deep in the Bulgarian forest. And it just seems like a completely magical place. Mm-hmm, out of a fairy tale. But no one will ever go there. And the village is dying. The people who are left there are old. Their children are long gone. They're not coming back. It's very sad and and deeply moving. And actually, my suspicion is that she will end up going to live there. Oh, you think so? Yeah, I saw that. And also, this is prefigured in the book because um, she she talks to her friend Marina, who's the sort of uh, soothsayer who uh, says, ah, you have drunk the waters of the Maria Fountain or something. You know, you will you will return kind of thing. So I could I could see her. I could see her. The layers of myth and history that permeate kind of this region, this um, this crossing uh, point between East and West. Had you ever heard of the big vacation? No. Do you recall the big vacation from the book? 
uh, well, what this general movement of peoples, the Muslims who were chucked out and sent back to Turkey and yeah. the Christians who were so sent over was, to Greece. So it was the biggest mobilization of um, people in peacetime since World War II. Yeah. And 340,000 Muslims were pushed out of Bulgaria by the Bulgarian government. And Kasabova makes clear that this was a distraction um, from the, the crumbling state uh, and they were made into scapegoats. I had a, a, a very much in mind as I was reading this um, that Louis de Bernier novel, um, Birds Without Wings. Have you ever read that? I haven't. Uh, it's a wonderful book and um, and very underrated. No one, few people have read it, but Sally in my book club has read it and we have a shared enthusiasm for it. And it takes as its subject this displacement of peoples and he just explores it wonderfully. It's a beautiful, heartbreaking novel that I recommend to anybody. But so I had that, I did have some background from having read that. So this this clarified that for me in a way that I found really interesting. So all in all, what did your book club make of it? I think everyone really enjoyed it. It was a smaller group than usual, which sometimes makes me wonder. It may just have been that diaries were clashing, or it may have been that people struggled a little bit and uh, and didn't get through it, so decided not to make it after all. Everyone very much lo- loved her language and loved learning about an area of the world that we never had any contact with before. It certainly made me want to travel I to love- this area, even while I was sli- I'm slightly terrified to travel there as well. Yeah. I lo- I, yes, I definitely love to go to those uh, those Bulgarian forests. I liked that at the beginning of the book there's a map and you sort of glance at it without too much interest and then you read the book. And then I, I don't know about you, but I turned back to look at that map more carefully and I realised it's just this wonderful, yeah, this wonderful sense of the topography of the journey that she went on and she ends up at the sea, the natural boundary where she's looking up out and she talks about, yeah, being in those coastal towns, whichever way you turn, something was behind you and nothing ahead of you. And then she muses, perhaps that's what history is. And I think that's one of the things she explores really wonderfully in this book this sense of history and time and where we are now and how we travel through it and the people that we encounter along the way and our own subjectivity within that context because she and she's trying to work out her own identity even as she's really an outsider and a bit of a a conundrum to the to the local people who can't quite understand why she's there so Kapka Kasabova was such a lovely discovery for me I'm so pleased to have read her it was just a delight I was so happy that your book club brought it up I will uh, let them know I think Charlie will be very pleased yeah for me there's not very little question in my mind if I had to choose one book out of our two books that we've discussed today I would absolutely and unhesitatingly choose Border by Kapka Kasabova how about you I can support that by saying we had a really lively and engaged discussion and we all felt that we had learned a lot about a region that we were not familiar with um, so yes highly recommend What to Read Next is always one of our favourite things to think about. Inspired by today's podcast, here are a few more recommendations you might want to consider for your next book club read. Following on from the border, I would recommend Children of Earth and Sky by Guy Gavriel Kay. It's a historical fantasy novel set in the Balkans in the 15th or 16th century. What is historical fantasy, you ask? Well, Kay always sets his worlds in a slightly different version of the world we live in now. So he builds on real history and real geography, but then shifts it ever so slightly. In Children of Earth and Sky, we have Venice, which is Ceresa, and Dubrovnik, which is Dubrava, and Istanbul is called Asherius. And it's an approach that I think would annoy lots of people, certainly some of my friends who like very accurate historical novels, but I've always really enjoyed them. And what this slight shift in perspective does is it allows Kay to weave in some magic, often kind of drawing on the stories and mythology of the land. And you do get a bit of the the same stories that Casabova intertwines in her narrative. I think it'd be a great book club book. I think there's a lot to talk about. It's also a real page turner and a lot of fun and perhaps a light follow up to uh, to Border for anyone who takes the time to read it. And I would recommend Exit West by Mohsin Hamid. Have you read that yet? No, I haven't. I need to borrow your copy. Yeah, I really recommend that. I read it recently. Um, I actually read it before I read Border, but the themes in it feed absolutely into what Kapka Kasabova is exploring. I think it would make a great book club book because it is written in quite an interesting way. It has a fantasy device, which might appeal to you, of doors or these sort of dark portals that allow people to travel from one country to another. But what's interesting about the way he treats it is it's handled very realistically and he has fun with exploring that as a device. 
And after my book club's discussion of The Tempest, I asked for some recommendations. So here, for the first time, are my friends Sally and Andy with their suggestions. I would recommend Margaret Atwood's other retelling of a classic story, which was the Penelope ad, which is a retelling of the Odyssey from the viewpoint of Penelope and the woman left at home. And do you think it would make a good book club read? Yeah, I think it would, because it is looking at a well-known story from a sort of feminist point of view, from a slightly different angle, and of course about the way that that story, you know, the Odyssey has sort of continued on through time. It's like, you know, 2,000 years on, we're still reusing elements of the story, which is in itself interesting. But it is a very slim read. That's not always a bad thing. So my recommendation is Station Eleven, Emily St. John Mandel. A virus has wiped out most of civilization. There's a group of people in Canada or North America, wandering players, taking Shakespeare plays, the remaining villages, as part of an orchestra, uh, just entertaining the villages, searching for a missing person. I won't say how it ends, but it's really about what people will take with them into the future, what's important, what's worth rescuing. So people look at planes and iPods and all sorts of things, but these people taking Shakespeare and classical music with half an orchestra with missing trombones or missing violins, but they're taking the best they can around to keep people happy, entertain the people in the future and keep Shakespeare alive. So that's all for today. Thanks for listening. Tune in next time when we'll be discussing my next book club book, which is The Trouble with Goats and Sheep. It's the debut novel of Joanna Cannon, and it's had a very warm reception in the press. It's a mystery of sorts, as two young girls set out to discover what's happened to the missing Mrs. Creasy during the British heatwave of 1976. And my book club are reading Prophets of Eternal Fjord by Kim Liner. It's a historical novel set in Greenland. The Guardian newspaper called it utterly unpredictable, down to the last page. But what will my book club make of it? Tune in to find out. If you want to comment on our books today or drop us a line, you can do so at thebookclubreview at gmail.com. Or if you want to keep an eye on what we're up to between podcasts, you can find us on Instagram at thebookclubreview. For now, thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>